worked uh, on Karen's book, uh, which will form uh, a very important basis for tonight's discussion. Karen is the author of a book entitled Trauma Doesn't Stop at the School Door. Uh, you may see in your chat feed that uh, we're offering a 15% discount on the book uh, if you use the Healing Schools code at TC Press. Um, so uh, I will begin, uh, and I'm going to do two things at the outset. Uh, I'm going to first uh, provide a brief introduction of the panelists, um, then ask that the panelists introduce themselves. Uh, and then I'm going to just, uh, before we, we, actually before we do that, I'm going to provide kind of an overview of uh, how this, this evening's webinar is going to be structured. So uh, actually, let me do that first. Uh, so uh, yeah, as I said, we'll, uh, uh, I'll do a brief introduction of each of the panelists this evening. Uh, I'll ask that the panelists uh, introduce themselves in turn and talk about uh, their connection to uh, tonight's topic. Uh, then we'll turn to Karen. Uh, Karen will provide some grounding uh, for tonight's discussion about trauma and the possibilities for healing. Uh, she will give a, a brief presentation uh, and she'll include some PowerPoint slides. Uh, after Karen's presentation, what we're going to do is we're going to create uh, a dialogue, uh, a dialogue between the panelists in which they both respond to uh, uh, Karen's presentation and also link uh, to, uh, again, the this, this second part of, of the focus for tonight's webinar, which is uh, not only identifying trauma, but how to respond to trauma and work towards healing. So we'll begin a conversation. For my part, what I'll be doing during the webinar is I will be monitoring the chat feed. Uh, and at various points as uh, uh, folks in the audience have questions uh, for the panelists, uh, I will uh, interrupt at, uh, at uh, an appropriate moment. And I'll share those questions to kind of amplify and, and uh, deepen the discussion. Um, and we'll see where that discussion leads. And so the intention is uh, for that discussion to kind of not only provide grounding and understanding for trauma and work towards healing, but to really get into the weeds a little bit and to uh, provide some just concrete, uh, some concrete, um, uh, uh, strategies for uh, uh, for uh, responding. Uh, so uh, with no further ado, let me uh, introduce, I'll do a brief introduction to each of the panelists, about each of the panelists, uh, and then uh, from their own words, uh, and then I will uh, uh, turn it to uh, each of the panelists to introduce themselves. So um, Karen, who is the author of Trauma Doesn't Stop at the School Door, is an author and educator who specializes in student success and the impact of trauma on learning and psychosocial development. When she's not teaching or reading her children, children her children's books to students, Karen, perhaps you can give a shout out to the titles of those books, uh, she can be found working with educators and parents to enable students to become their best selves. Uh, then we have uh, Sakina Magruder, uh, who is a national board certified teacher with experience in both elementary and secondary education. Uh, she currently teaches kindergarten in Montgomery County, Maryland, and will be celebrating 100 days of virtual learning soon. Sakina enjoys family movie and game nights with her daughter, Ella, and husband, Carl. She's excited to share her experiences with trauma and healing while teaching virtually. Uh, and uh, we also have on the panel tonight uh, uh, Patricia Ford McIntosh Neal, who is uh, has, brings quite a resume uh, to tonight's discussion. She's a former teacher, counselor, director of student services in a secondary school in Fairfax, Fairfax County, Virginia. Uh, Pat has served on the board of directors for Fairfax County Education Association and the Virginia Education Association. Currently, and for the past 10 years, she holds the position of coordinator at large and seal of approval chair for the National Education Association Women's Caucus. She also serves as president 
of the District of Columbia State Organization of Delta Gamma, Gamma Society International, uh, AKA DKG, which is an international organization composed of active classroom teachers and retired educators. DKG provides personal and professional development opportunities for women educators. And Pat served uh, from 1971 to 1980 uh, in the District of Columbia Public Schools and then moved to Fairfax County Public Schools from 1980 to 2009. And uh, also we have on the panel uh, uh, Ed Wang, uh, who describes himself in the following way. As a loving grandfather of two smart and beautiful grandfather, uh, granddaughters and a child psychologist, Ed's work focuses on the social and emotional well-being of children and young adults in the U.S and internationally. He uses the person-centered approach to foster individual stories, family and community oral history of hope, strengths, and resiliency to regulate traumatic experience and promote growth and healing. And we could certainly use a lot of that right now. Uh, so without further ado, let me turn this uh, over to the panelists and have each of you introduce yourself and give a brief introduction of, of uh, what uh, you're going to bring to tonight's discussion. So Sakina, let's um, actually, uh, Karen, let's start with you. Okay, so hello everyone. Welcome, nice to have all of you here. Um, I, I thought what I would share with you is that this book was written um, before the pandemic. Now the page proofs came out as the pandemic was starting in March of 2020, which enabled parts of the book to be edited to reflect the impact of the pandemic. But here's the, the observation I wanna, I have two observations. The first is that we had plenty of trauma of a wide sort, both family dysfunction, natural disasters and person-made trauma before the pandemic and the violence in DC and the protests in the summer and a myriad of other things that have happened with social distancing and masks. And all of that has made the issues in the book even more front and center than they were before. But it's very easy when you use the word trauma for people to feel very pessimistic and scared. Many people don't even like the word. So I just wanna say that what I'm going to add is about hope. I, I hope you can see this. Um, it's a little handheld stone, which I'll talk about later. And the last few chapters in the book, particularly the last chapter actually talks about hope. And so when we talk about schools as places for healing, I have hope. And one of the things that I know is we talk about Pandora's box and all the horrible things that fell out of it. Well, there's one thing that never fell out of Pandora's box and people don't remember this from the myth and that's hope. And so I hope this conversation will restore hope by seeing schools as places of healing. Thank you, Karen. Uh, Sakina, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Sakina Magruder. Um, again, I teach kindergarten. And I believe what I bring to this conversation is the perspective of uh, teachers, educators, um, as far as what they're dealing with it, um, for in regards to trauma, with regards to virtual teaching. Um, I mean, this all has affected everyone, not only the teachers, but the students as well, because what our normal day-to-day -day, uh, operations at school kind of just got closed up abruptly. And it's been really difficult on everyone adjusting. But you know, as teachers do, we're resilient. <laughs> um, but the students, um, I think has, it's been difficult for them. So I kind of bring that perspective and it's in terms of what I'm noticing with my students. Um, and not only with my kindergartners, I actually interact with a lot of students from a different grade levels because I'm their buddy <laughs> to get them through this uh, pandemic. And um, I'm, I can tell you this, um, Dr. Gross, just reading your book has restored my hope. And I'm hoping that any educators or anybody in any field um, 
once they are done with this conversation will also feel what I feel is that there is hope and I look forward to when this all can change and I've learned about how to deal with my own trauma as well as recognizes it it, it, it was well with the students so that's my <laughs> conversation. That's great. Thank you. Sakina. Pat, do you want to introduce yourself please? Yes. Well, as an educator and counselor, and when I was director of student services, I was over the guidance department and had five counselors. And we were always dealing with crises. And the school is a big community. And what we had to do every day was to deal with not only the students, but we had to deal with the needs of the teachers who were going through their own crises and dealing with students and personal crises. We also had to deal with the parents who would come to us about their children. And just dealing with everyone together, uh, mental health was a big thing and we tried to coordinate with the psychologist and the social worker and so um, I'm always looking for resources to help teachers and one thing um, I did in my school was to try to start well I did start a wellness center so that teachers had a special place to go a room it wasn't the teacher's lounge it was a room where they could go and relax um, there wasn't a copy machine they're interfering, but they had comfortable chairs, they had little games and music they could play or they could read and just put their feet up and just sort of recollect before they went back to their classroom. And a short story I want to tell you is that with DKG, my um, News Ada chapter, two members, uh, Joanne Finney and uh, Beverly Battle, were concerned about our members during the pandemic, not being able to communicate. We wondered, well, how is everyone doing? Because we're always so close. So they started a weekly chat. We called it a sister chat. So every Thursday from three, five, we would talk. We maybe talk about recipes or we really didn't have any particular topic. Sometimes we would just be there for each other or we would listen to the teachers share what they had been going through. And so in the summer around August, there was one member who's a pre-K teacher and she got very emotional on the call and she was, very worried about having to go back to school. No one told her, you know, would they have to go back? Would it still be virtual? Were they going to get any training? What would it look like in the building? So she had a lot of anxiety. And Karen was on the phone with us and she decided she would offer her services to us to sort of help. And so we've had three workshops on trauma and educators given by Karen Gross. Uh, and it's just been helpful. And so um, I just try to find resources for educators and I put some in the chat. So that's my connection. Great, thank you. Thank you, Pat. Uh, Ed? Yeah, um, well, first of all, thank you, Brian, uh, to be part of this and definitely, you know, Karen uh, of, of, in terms of her invitation and then also get, getting this chance to work with Sakina and Pat as well. I really appreciate that and uh, all the, all the participants today, you know, that uh, right now I notice is up to 84. And uh, thank you for taking at five o'clock joining us and uh, please stay with us. It's, it's gonna be somewhat of a long night, but I, I hope that uh, we can uh, come forward and, and share with you and hear from you as well in terms of what's happening uh, in the educational world. Uh, well, I'm kind of the oddball out of uh, this group here. I'm not an educator. Uh, but I do a lot of training in regard to about trauma. Uh, how do an individual physically responds to demands or stress? Uh, what are the traumatic response both physically and psychologically? And I'm privileged in many ways, uh, actually do training with schools as well as providing consultation uh, with school as well. So in some sense, I'm kind of still on the very much of the outside, but I, I guess I'm bringing in something that I know in my kind of a, medical and uh, psychological world about trauma. So I really appreciate that. Um, one, maybe one just quick thing about, and I want to go right into it. I can't, uh, because I know this, this is gonna be a very dynamic, organic kind of discussion, but I also want to thank you. I noticed that uh, David Dooley uh, actually already suggest a mention about a resource, uh, uh, bumper sticker. Wow, that's great, you know, bumper sticker, you know, when we're ready, all go back to our regular driving and all these things. That's very much of an obvious uh, kind of a, a highlight in terms of some of the needs of trauma and so forth. And I'm gonna take a look at what they are. So thank you so much. We already have uh, different participants really offering in terms of what they know. Um, so that's, that's tremendous. So just quick, quickly go into my little story. Uh, my story is not little, I think it's a big story. Uh, you know, uh, when Karen wrote the book, you know, trauma doesn't stop at the, at the school door, uh, it is very obvious. And then of course, tonight our title is, can school be a place 
for healing trauma. So the fact is this, let me share with you a very personal story. Um, we all have different experience, you know, when we walk into a school, whether it's students or staff at school. And guess what? When I walk into a school, let's say when I was young, uh, no one really asked me. Uh, I'm actually at a very young age. Uh, I experienced family violence during my childhood year. Uh, my, I lost my mother when I was a child. And then subsequently, uh, in my adolescence year, I lost uh, my brother uh, due to suicide. And really kind of fast forward uh, to even nowadays or the past number of uh, 10, 20 years, you know what, um, as someone that, you know, you look at me, I have been called uh, a Jap. I have been called a uh, gook. Uh, it's all because of that individual's or individual's exposure, you know, to the media, to the news and so forth. And I, sometimes I'm so glad even when people call me a chink, because I finally say, ha, at least I can identify myself and they identify correctly that I'm Chinese. So the fact is that um, that experience continue even uh, related to the pandemic. It's not an easy position when I'm being reminded about the China virus. Yes, it is very true that is, at least as far as we know now, it's originated from Wuhan, China. Just, but just being singled out doesn't me make me feel any better, even though I'm trying to be extremely objective and say, I don't want to that happen to anyone, to any country. So I just kind of want to share with you that trauma or trauma experience is always uh, I guess it's, it's real life and well, you know, we continue to experience that. And I continue to experience that for the past, I would say 25 years. And then if you count my childhood, it will be for the past, what, 55 years, you know, I'm 65 right now. So, um, so anyway, so that's the reason why I, I felt like this is very important for us to have this uh, conversation among ourselves. So, so thank you again for the invitation. Great, thank you, Ed. Um, so now let's turn to Karen. Uh, and Karen, you're going to provide us with uh, an overview uh, of Absolutely. trauma. Um, so if Emily can put the slides up, we'll go through them. I, I'm not a big fan of PowerPoint, frankly, but um, for these purposes, it will allow us to cover a wide range of material. And they'll be available to all of you. Um, so that you can um, find them later and use them. So they'll be up for now and then we'll take them down um, so that it feels a little less um, formal and more of a conversation. So let's go to the next slide. So for me, um, I'd like you just to think about the questions here and the individuals pictured here. And can you describe what these students are experiencing? And then the question, how do you know? Um, the who and the whys behind this. So just take a minute and look at the students. So for me, one of the issues, and we can certainly converse about this, is that many people can obviously see that these students are struggling and are stressed or unhappy or disassociated or concerned or vacant eyes. But what we often don't ask is why we often make assumptions with respect to our students. We look at their behavior and we reach a conclusion and we don't ask the why question. And um, I just wanna point out that the asking questions now, thoughtful questions, because are, are more critical now than ever before. And part of the reason for that is that instead of assuming we understand what people are feeling, 
we need to understand why. And for many people, just knowing that someone is asking them a question and allowing them to provide an explanation is the beginning of reciprocity and engagement. And so one of the things that we know about trauma is that you don't walk around wearing a big sign with a T on it that says trauma. You know, I used to say to my law students many decades ago, you know, clients don't come in wearing a sign saying, I have a problem with section 2207 of the UCC and I think there's an intersection with state UDAP statutes. They come in and they tell a story. And so I want to encourage people to think about the questions that we can ask of our students so that we can understand why they're feeling the way they are. Because trauma happens to you. It's not something you do. It happens to you. And I'll share a story about this later. Um, but that is why in the chat, I did put a book called Wait What? by James Ryan, who used to be the Dean of the Harvard School of Education and now is the president of the University of Virginia, at least I still think he's there. Um, and wait what is the set of five or six questions we should each ask our students and ask ourselves. They are wonderful, wonderful questions and really thoughtful ways of engaging with our students. So let's go to the next slide. So um, how do we know if the answer to the prior question is that this, our students have been experiencing trauma? And there are actually technically 36 plus measures of trauma. Um, many people focus on the adverse childhood experience score, um, which measures family dysfunction. It doesn't, and some versions of it have expanded to look at community dysfunction, um, but it doesn't measure um, things like the pandemic or violence in the capital or systemic racial or ethnic or gender discrimination. And so for me, one of the important things to realize is that we have many ways of measuring trauma and then identifying its symptomology. I am not suggesting that we as educators administer these to our students, but there are ways that we can detect trauma through the behavior that students exhibit, which is why asking the question, share with me why, or share with me how um, are very important. So trauma symptomology many people say is biphasic, but it's actually, in my view, triphasic. It has dysregulation, which is the student who's acting out, and depending on their age, they act out differently. That's the student who throws the chair or the book or yells or shouts or disrupts or pushes their neighbor. Then there's disassociation. That's the student who isolates him or herself from others, sits in the back, pays attention to their laptop, doesn't engage effectively. By the way, dysregulated students don't either. But sometimes disassociated students disassociate from themselves and their own feelings. Um, and then there are over-regulated students. And over-regulated students are the ones who are what we used to call the goody two-shoes students. They do everything right. And then some, as a way of masking what they're feeling, and the sad part is that we often don't notice that as a symptom of trauma because they're being so quote good and making life easier for the educator. And so for me, one of the hardest parts is to recognize that a given student can be dysregulated, disassociated or overregulated in the same day, the same week, the same hour, the same month, they can shift. And educators can learn if we provided them with the tools, which sadly we often don't, of how to be trauma sensitive, trauma aware, trauma responsive. And so if we go to the next slide, we know that our brains are wired for connectivity. 
I mean, we have myriad of neural pathways. And what trauma does is it truncates or upends that connectivity. And masks and social distancing and school closures make that even harder. But when you have that disruption, it disrupts cognition, it disrupts psychosocial development, it erodes play and joy. And by the way, trauma never disappears. We can ameliorate it, but it can be re-triggered. And the best way for me to share this with all of you really quickly is if you think of, make your hand into a fist like this with me here and put one hand around your wrist. Okay, so the hand around the wrist is um, your primitive brain, your reptilian brain. And your thumb here inside is your limbic system, your feeling system. And what covers the top is your cognition. And there are various parts of all this. But when you're traumatized, here's what happens. Your brain literally flips out. And when kids say, I'm flipped out, they literally are flipped out. Their brain has flipped out. And part of the job of finding ways to ameliorate trauma is to get the limbic system back and to get the cognition back by dealing with what's here, which is the autonomic nervous system where acute trauma occurs by what we know as the reptilian primitive brain stem of the parasympathetic, the sympathetic and enteric nervous systems. That's the stuff that gives you the F words, the fight, flight, freeze, faint, and fawn. I think there are five, many people only use three. But actually students can understand if you show them this, that here's where the behavior's coming from right now down here and your brain's like this. And our job is to get it like this so that cognition and feelings can be restored. So let's go to the next slide. So we've actually covered this. There's acute trauma symptomology and deferred trauma symptomology, and we can educate people to identify it, not to substitute educators for psychologists or social workers or school nurses or psychiatrists, but instead to be able to identify what's happening enough to manage their own classroom, foster learning and student success and refer students who need referrals whether on their own or through their parents to the resources they're needed in a team-like approach. So if we go to the next slide. So this slide describes what trauma takes away um, and it takes away our structure, our stability, our safety, our subtlety as in personalization and someone's. And I wanna just point to this because at the end of the day, for all the trauma there is, the uniformly recognized way of helping people is to create reciprocity and connection and engagement. And sadly, in today's world with masks and social distancing and online, we have cut off what is one of the ameliorating factors of trauma, which is connectivity, reciprocity between adults and their students. And so the absence of that is deeply felt and deeply difficult for students as well as for educators. So if we go to the next slide, the next slide talks about the architecture for what teachers can do. Well, what we can all do, we can name what's happening, identify the trauma, then we can work to tame it through a myriad of approaches, and then we can frame it in two uses of the word frame, as in put it in a frame to make it important and recognize its significance, which is why we can heal schools if we identify what's going on and then frame it as in creating like a frame to a house, what holds everything up. So trauma shouldn't be pushed under a rug. Trauma, by the way, even if you push it there, won't stay there. Um, it'll keep popping up and it'll keep getting re-triggered. And so we have to name it, tame it, and frame it. And if we can help our educators to become trauma responsive and the schools to become trauma responsive institutions, they can serve to heal students 
for that among many other reasons. Then if we go to the next slide, um, the D words, um, which we can look at later um, and you can look at on your own are the things that restore what trauma takes away. So if we have trauma and its symptomology, dialogue, diversion, drawing, clay, dance, dazzle and delight are all pathways to restoring what trauma takes away. Many of these use the senses, but they all at their core enable us to control the autonomic nervous system, which goes out of whack, and then to understand our feelings and then to cognate. So I'm sure Ed will talk later about the triangle between emotions, thoughts, and behaviors. They're interlinked. If we can intervene and engage people, we can open the neural pathways that trauma shuts down, create neural pathways, and enable students to engage yet again. And just to show you one sample of those, I, I have what are called kamochis, which are feeling toys. They have different um, emotions on them. And when I was a college president, I put a bucket of these out. Um, this one is very important. It says brave. Um, I used to put them out in a big bucket on my desk. And I'd say to students, faculty and staff, take one for how you're feeling today. And if you feel different tomorrow, switch it out. And there were hundreds of them all over campus. And what it was doing was legitimating the naming and then ultimately the taming and the framing um, that they were experiencing. By the way, now is not the time for punishment or strict rules. Um, structure is important, but there's no demerits here. Trauma happens to you. It's not intent-based. So let's just go to the next slide. So hope exists. It isn't quixotic. It's real. And schools can be a place of healing. And I just want to share there's both hope there, but that other is a, a, a piece of um, kintsugi pottery. And here's one that I made. And the saying that goes with these is more beautiful for being broken. So in kintsugi pottery, when things break, you put them back together and reseal them with gold. And I have actually done this with groups of educators. Like if there's a school shooting, they've all brought in a plate, we've broken the plates and then put them back together and said, more beautiful for being broken and displayed. So the point is that while there are many, many downsides to trauma, there are also some upsides that are worth recognizing. And there are ways of dealing with trauma and there are ways of responding if we can fill our toolbox with those skills. Mm -hmm. And then if we go, I think, to the last slide. Um, so here's my observation for all of you who are educators. Everything that I've said focuses on the educator needing to work well with students and parents. And if they themselves are struggling, it's really hard to do the work that being trauma responsive requires. In other words, you can't pour from an empty cup. So how you fill the teacher cup, how you make it so that they can function well, whether it's primary trauma, secondary trauma, or vicarious trauma that they're experiencing, we need to help them because otherwise they can't help our students. And by the way, self-care is not selfish, although we often mistake it for that. And I just wanna urge all of you who are educators that self-care now is more important perhaps than ever. And I think that's, unless there's one more, I think that's it for the slide. So let's go back to the conversation with that overview, which is by the way, detailed in various chapters. The book is divided into three parts, name, tame, and frame. Great, Karen, thank you so much. There, there was a, a lot to take in there and uh, many places where we can begin a conversation. So um, maybe maybe one place to, to, to do is just to, to start with the, um, 
with the latter part of, of your discussion, Karen, and to and and to focus on that that pivot from uh, naming to taming. Uh, and Sakina, maybe you can speak to something in your practice, in your experience, uh, that that speaks to that. Sure. Hello, everyone. Again, so I'm just going to go back to to you know I'm going to speak to what I know. Um, so Karen, the other day was interesting. I logged on with the kids, and I had a feeling. And it was just, I, I normally just would just push it down. And I just shared it with the kids. And I said, you know, guys, I really miss, you know, having centers in my classroom. And surprisingly, the students were like, what are centers? And it just led to another conversation. And we all sat for like, you know, the first 15 minutes of class and they started to name things that they miss as well. And a lot of my students said, I miss going to the park or I miss seeing my cousins. And it was, I think it was what was needed at the time. And I feel like a lot of my instruction nowadays is that, is like, what, what are we feeling boys and girls? And let's discuss it. And I'm telling you, I think it made for a wonderful day of learning just because I realized it. you know, I normally wouldn't share that with the kids, but I think they're feeling and they're sensing the same things that I'm sensing. And I think that we need more of that. Um, and in regards to trauma, I'm having, a, I have a, a lot of uh, special ed students. I have all of them in kindergarten and I enjoy it. Um, but uh, we were just talking about like in the morning doing a wellness check-in and you don't even have to call it a wellness check-in. You could just call it a check-in. That's what we do. And I thought to myself, rather than just asking them the question every day of how are you feeling? I thought as a kid, how would I want to answer that? So certain weeks we do a Play-Doh. They take out their Play-Doh and they use their whiteboards and they draw a face and then they use their Play-Doh to show me how they're feeling. And I think they're excited about it. They hold it up because they're all excited because the Play-Doh sticks to the whiteboard. But then it's that moment where it's like, you know, sir, sir, another scholar or we call our student scholar, another scholar is feeling the same way I'm feeling. And that connectivity starts again. And it's so important. And then the other day I thought about it. I said, why don't you guys go in your house and do a scavenger hunt and find something that is the color of how you're feeling today and bring it back. So we get different ways to share. And I think that that's what's kind of living in me right now and what's living in my instructions at time to like, okay, we're gonna put that curriculum aside and let's just share and talk about our feelings. And I think that's how we've been, how we've been making it through each day. And so I don't know if that's giving them hope <laughs> and I hope it is, but I know for me that those moments in instruction is more important than anything else. Very powerful, thank you, Sakina. Uh, Pat, do you wanna to speak to the the pivot from naming to taming? Um, you know what, I can kind of expand on what Sakina did. It's sure. marvelous, tremendous what she did. Uh, I think what it's also telling me is that there is, uh, because of the issue of the pandemic, because of the changing of how, you know, uh, education is being delivered. There is a need to connect. I'm going to use some of her words because I, I don't have to even think of other words because I think she is right on the spot. Uh, education now is a little different than I think pre-pandemic. Part of it's because of the duration of the pandemic itself. It's not an ending yet. And so I think what she identified is, is that sense of, you know, her students need to connect with each other. And I think so that's number one, connect. Ties into, I guess, what uh, Karen said about name it and tame it, her exercise. The fact is that, you know, not only just an exercise, but it's also an exercise of, in a very positive way now, about, you know, that feeling brain, you know, when Karen was showing us, you know, the, the hand model. So she is emphasizing actually the positive because it's also very useful because at times we so much spend so much time emphasizing or paying attention to the negative, you know, the little feelings. And then of course, when it comes to the big feelings and of course it comes to the meltdown, she is actually in some sense really set a good foundation and say, let's also uh, focusing on the positive. So, you know, using that hand model itself, uh, Karen was saying, you know, the thumb or the palm area is the limbic system. She's basically what Sakina is doing is right on, on target is to nurture that, nurture that, uh, that feeling brain by naming it 
And then, of course, by expanding that, and then, you, of course, you're going to your the so-called upstairs brain, you know, rather than preventing, it's really, in some senses, a prevention, rather than someone's going to go like this, as, uh, you know, uh, Karen described, it's continued to maintain so that this part, the feeling brain, doesn't hijack, you know, the thinking brain. And so I think that she is actually doing all the right thing and it re really reflects what Karen said about, uh, you know, naming and taming. You know, when they describe or report it to her, to each other, now that's the relationship, that's a beautiful part of the relationship among that class is that, you know, that feelings, both in terms of the kind of the sadness, uh, whatever those feelings are. But I think that she also encouraged in some sense to develop out of that, the positive feelings so it's a really nice balance that she added into, you know, her her style, her curriculum for right now. I, I have no doubt that she also do that even uh, prior to the pandemic. I think that's her style. That's her understanding about the importance of feelings as well as the relationship, which we, of course, in our world, we call social emotional development. And she is addressing that. Can you, Ed, just mention the feeling alphabet activity set? Because I think it ties into this. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, well, just very quickly, because I want to hear what from pet perspective as well. Um, the feeling alphabets uh, practice um, is the feeling uh, alphabet activity set that uh, Karen and I put together really talks about really how to integrate name the feelings and, and so forth. I'm not gonna to spend too much time on it. Maybe someone can type it where they can find that link. Uh, yeah. They can actually, if they would like to, is relatively in, inexpensive. Uh, a few dollars, you actually can get a lot of techniques that uh, both uh, Karen and I, you know, we share. Uh, so a very, it's very specific techniques oriented but it's really focusing on the feeling brains, the thinking brain. And I think Karen mentioned, and, and we can talk about that a little later, you know, the, what we call the, the cognitive triangle, thinking, feeling, and of course, behavior, you know, which that's the, that's the tough one. That's the biggie. How do we work with behavior? And, and I always admired uh, just one more thing about teachers. You know, I, I go, I went to so many observation in classrooms and so forth. You know they have to manage the whole entire class it's not just one students or two students that beginning to have little feelings maybe evolving to a big feelings they have to manage the whole thing but anyway uh the uh, feeling alphabet is, is something that karen and i put together thank you for for that reminder and and it's very concrete with a lot of resources and and kind of a practice activity set yeah good thank you Ed. You know, uh, Ed, talking about the feeling alphabet, that's what counselors do all the time. They use the feelings, they talk with the students. And I think teachers really have to be a counselor today because they're there by themselves and they have to look at the class and say, well, how are you feeling today? You know, and maybe hold what color, who's blue today? You know, like Sakina was saying, you know, find color in the house and how you feel. And I think it's all about connecting, you know, um, like you said, to frame it, we can see what's happening, but we have to connect with some resources. And I think teachers need to reach out to their counselor, to their social worker and the psychologist in their school and to reach those kids who are suffering. I was reading in the paper, uh, there was an article in the uh, Post, Washington Post on January 22nd about a simmering mental health crisis for US school children. And they really are talking about the mental health problems on the rise. You know, before when you would refer students to go and see a mental health specialist, it would be a couple of weeks. Now they're so booked, it's taken three and four months. And a lot of the parents are really reaching out because they see dramatic changes in their children and the teachers are seeing it. Those students who were very active are now withdrawing. The isolation is doing something to students. And I think that's why they're trying to get students back into school because more parents are calling and complaining about what do I do with my child, um, the behaviors, the grades are dropping. Uh, we've had more suicides than we've had ever before because of the isolation, um, the lack of connectivity. And I think the family disruptions, some students are even typing into their teachers, I don't feel safe at home anymore. 
And when you see that, you know, and teachers are seeing uh, lots of people walking around where they're trying to teach, um, students who are sitting in bed, students who won't get dressed, students who are jumping up and down, or students who just won't turn on and do anything. Uh, a lot of students have shut down. They just can't do the work anymore. There's overload. And so we're going to have to find a way to connect to the outside. But it's not good for kids to be isolated this long. And the experts are saying that they've got to get back into communication. The school was a safe place for them. And like Karen in her book, that safety was taken away. They don't have a safe place. We don't know what's going on with the lack of the food, with um, housing, with jobs being lost, the parents are under stress, the students are feeling that stress and they have nowhere to go. They have no one to talk to. And so how do we connect to them and get them the resources that they need? I know a lot of counselors are doing creative things. I think I read in Atlanta, Georgia, one counselor would meet kids at school and walk around the building with them to keep a social distance just to be able to talk with them. I don't know if the local screen committees are trying to meet online to help kids because before you could refer students to the committee to be screened to get help. Now, how are they getting those services? And even those with services, it's hard to meet the needs of special ed students. And so we really have to look at how we're going to help kids because this is not going away. And I guess, Ed, you can address it, but the mental health problems, we're going to see them for the next five to 10 years in our students. And so when we go back, the teachers and in D.C., uh, they're talking about sending teachers back February 1st into the schools. And they don't know if it's a safe environment. But one thing I can say is that you need to belong to a union, um, the American Federation of Teachers or the National Education Association. Uh, Becky Pring was the president. And I was on a webinar last week and they had Dr. Jill Biden. And she's still teaching at Northern Virginia Community College, English instructor. And she says, we're, we're going to get help. One thing we can have hope for is that we have a president who is going to help education and is pro-education. So we're going to get the resources that we need because he wants to get us back into the schools. We want to go back. We want to make sure it's safe. And so we want teachers to feel safe. And they need someone besides them to advocate for them. And I think the teacher unions, NEA, AFT, are good avenues to help make sure that they go back into a safe building, a safe space, and, you know, to help them with that. Yeah, I, I just want to quickly, uh, I'm sorry, Karen. No, go ahead. Ahead. no you go. Uh, no, I'm, I'm just actually kind of summarize a little bit again uh, in terms of what being said before. And, and oh, you know, I'm just thinking about, I remember, um, you know, someone was asking me, you know, okay, you're the mental health professional, tell, tell us, you know, you know, in terms of, uh, what we need to do, you know, with school. And the fact is that I think the school is already doing it. Uh, you know, for they, they, they educate, I think they support, and certainly they want to prepare, you know, all students for success. You know, that, that's how I see schools and that they are doing it. Uh, but this time is, is very different uh, because of this kind of a long lasting impact. We're not just talking about, you know, a couple months, you know, we're not talking about a hurricane. We're talking about a pandemic that has lasted two years and it's going to continue. So there's also the uncertainty in terms of what's going on. And then also all the decision about opening school up, not opening school up. That is so stressful, you know, for both the educators as well as the students, because, you know, educators also have children, you know, and to yes. have to manage. So, so there's so much that... Uh, we, so I guess the, the thing about what I heard from you and I want to reemphasize and I'll just stop because uh, I, I know that I, you know Karen probably have a lot to say and Sakina as well. To me, it is important and you said it, Pat, safety. I think that school somehow has to work towards safety, healthy and welcoming again. Yes. How do you do that? How do you do that virtually? And how do you do that when even when the you know the children and, and, and adolescents when they go back, you know, you still have to work on those three issues: safety and healthy and welcoming. That is, you all know much better than I do. That's a big, big challenge. Oh, it's an enormous challenge. But so so let me address some of that and some of Pat and Sakina's observations, and then we can open it back up again to comments. Um, I, I think we have underestimated, here's a silver lining. 
I think we've underestimated the importance of schools to many, many children and the amazing things that schools do that are not just content-based. They provide psychosocial development, they provide role models, they provide ways to engage with peers, they provide food, they provide healthcare, they provide psychological well-being. And I think we've only now started to acknowledge the myriad of ways in which schools can currently do, but can even more, especially if they become trauma responsive, ways to help students heal. But we have to start with recognizing what they can do, the role they can play, and the importance of that role. So the second point I wanna make is that I, I got a call from a parent saying, I have another parent who has to talk to her child is really upset. And I said, well, I'm not a therapist, I'm an educator. So if the child is really like depressed or something, she should bring in a, a psychotherapist or a psychologist. And she said, no, no, I, I think this is something she just doesn't know how to handle the child. And I said, so share with me what happened. So apparently the child was running around the house going, I wanna go to school, I wanna go to school, I wanna go to school, I want the pandemic to go away, shouting around the house. Now that's dysregulated behavior. But what's interesting is that the parent hearing that didn't know strategies to help that student take those emotions, recognize the complexity of what's going on in our world and try to help that student see, yes, it's a really hard time. It's a hard time for me too. It's very hard not to engage with your peers and then to offer up some alternatives that create connection even in the absence of physical connection which gets me to the next point. I think the absence of touch has been one of the most significant negatives of all of this. And for people who are educators, um, the idea of the comforting touch, the comforting look, the hug, um, all I'm now talking about appropriate engagement with students is missing. And I think we're missing it in our own lives. And in the chat room, somebody pointed out that um, tactile things are, are needed now because we've lost touch with another person. So we have to get the touch in another way. And my last point is that I think we made a really big mistake when we thought this was going to be like summer vacation and students would get to go home and hang out and whatever. First of all, for many students, home is not a good right. place. I mean, we gotta be honest here about the high level of family dysfunction. Between 60, well, between 50 and 65% of all kids, this is pre-pandemic data, had experienced at least one trauma. 70% of adults had experienced at least one trauma. So families are struggling. It is not the place where kids actually, many kids wanna hang out. And even if you did wanna hang out in a fully functional family for a week or two weeks or three weeks, not for six months, not for eight months. And as the kids are older, high schoolers and college students who are feeling regressing regression because they're now back in the fold and their parents are engaging with them. Um, so my point is all of this points to using schools, especially moving forward as places of healing, but we can't turn them on like we shut them down, like a light switch. We have to do this with preparation and planning and prediction. We have to be really thoughtful about how we turn our schools into being trauma responsive and which then includes all the positive variables that we talked about. So I think that's our challenge. We can do it, but we have to both see it and then want to do it. Mm -hmm. 
You know, you're so right, Karen. I think that teachers have to advocate for themselves at this point. When we talk about reopening schools, they have to let the administrators and the school board know what they need. That They need training. They need help before the kids come in. Someone needs to deal with the teachers because no one has been dealing with the teachers and what they've been going through. It's like they're overlooked. Just get the schools open. Well, it's not that simple just to open the doors of the school. Those mm -hmm. teachers going in have feelings and they've been stressed just as much as the kids. And so no one has dealt with their feelings. They haven't had their regular team meetings to talk with the other teachers. They haven't had that support. You know, they have had no one to go to and they are struggling by themselves and trying to keep their lives going. So I think teachers really have to say, look, give us something before you go back and open those doors. We need some training. We need someone to talk with us and to get their minds reframed. Um, I think I read in the paper there was something about reframing your mind and thinking the positives. And so that sometimes you may have to take your own mental health into your hands and reframe your thinking in order to go on and do something positive. But, but you know, you have to own the negative feelings too, both the positive and the negatives. Right. And the part of the problem, I actually created, just so you can all see it, a feeling tree where you put your positive and negative feelings um, and, and students can do this if they're in person, they can put sticky notes on a board or a whatever to be able to express the negatives as well as the positives. By the way, three positives for every one negative is sort of the rule of thumb. In the workplace, it's higher, <laughs> by the way. But how do we train all these teachers when the push is to get them back and by the way, they're all fatigued. They're Zoom fatigued. They're online fatigued. Those doing hybrid are really struggling and they have their own trauma. So they've got primary trauma themselves. And then they've got the secondary trauma that, they've get, that they catch like a virus from their students and their family and the whole world at large. And then vicarious trauma. Um, so my question is, and, and by the way, we don't have enough school psychologists. We don't have enough social workers. We don't have enough counselors. We don't have enough. And by the way, many people are not interested in returning to teaching now. Many don't want to come and some have passed away. So how do we get from what we want to, to what you're describing, Pat, with all the kinds of supports that teachers really need? And it hurts me because they can't help their students right. if they're struggling. So maybe Sakina has ideas. I was going to jump in. Um, I'm just going to backtrack a little and just say, um, because our school right now is developing a plan to return. And um, they're coming up with what we're calling learning pods. And basically, that is just a classroom full of students who are in grades from K through 5. And it's going to be about 12 students. And I know what you're thinking, like, what? Yes, that's what I said. But in those classrooms, there will not be actually one of us in the classroom. They're using para paraprofessionals, um, other resources, other people to be in the in the classroom with them. So essentially, the students will still be virtual because <laughs> each kid from different grade levels have to log back on to be with their teacher. So you know, me in essence was thinking. Um, I don't think that we've been very transparent with this with the parents. I know a lot of parents want their students to go to school and believe it or not, even I want to go back. Um, but I'm not going to do it at, at, at a risk for myself or the other students. Um, but I feel like the parents really need to see what it is in the students, what it is they're returning to. Because again, that's that thinking of we're going back to school and what it used to look like. But the truth of the matter is it's not. Um, you know, there are only going to be 12 of you in the classroom and you'll be lucky if you get a chance to interact with somebody. I feel that piece is missing. And I don't know if that's the hope, Karen, that they're trying to hold on to, but I feel like it's almost misleading because um, I had, a, I, I had my, my buddy today and she comes to my classroom every day. I, she's a third grader, fantastic, but she just needs somebody to talk to. So, you know, we're recognizing early at our school students who we, we we're reaching out to and we're pairing them with teachers, which is a great program that we started years ago. So I actually have a student who I meet with and I noticed today when she came into my Zoom, I said, oh, you're at school. And she said, yes, but she didn't say it with excitement. It was, yeah, I'm here. And I said, oh, what's, what's, what's that? What's that coming from? What's, talk to me about it. And she said, well, I'd rather just be at home. 
why am I back at school? My friends aren't here. I, my teacher isn't here. And again, I realized, I said, uh oh, we have a problem here because this is actually a picture, a window into what we're getting ready to do in March. And here we have a, a student who's telling us, this is not what I wanted. She said, she even said with her own words, I would rather be at home because at least at home, I'm around my family. And I keep saying this and I feel like it's falling on deaf ears. Like, you know, it's almost like me telling my child to go back to school, but I know my child at home with me is it's an essential part to her learning. What she's telling me is at home, it, my family was an essential piece to me. And I said to her, I said, well, why do you feel you are here? You know, like, how'd you get here? And she told me, she said, well, I believe it's because, you know, my teacher and I were not connecting. And I'm, that just blew my mind because it, this is a third grader talking to me, saying these things. And here we go back to that connection again. She even told me, she was like, I don't feel like my teacher understands me. We're not connecting. And she, she's so sweet in that she said, I'm not telling you that she's not nice, but she's telling me, but we're not connecting. And, and then she referenced her first grade teacher and her second grade teacher and the relationship she had with them. And I was just thinking, is it because she was in person with them, you know, because it's hard to make that connection virtually. Um, but a lot of things started to go through my mind just having this conversation. And not only that, I think I shared with her my reservations just to let her know that she's not alone because the kids are probably thinking it's just them. But I said, as an adult, I'm a little nervous about this too, you know, it's a lot of change and, um, you know, we were changing in March and now we're changing again in another March. <laughs> Here we are again in March again, going through all these changes. And I'm thinking as a school, and I've said this before in meetings, we have to be prepared, not only in by creating a space with the students, but they're going to need more than that when they return. They're going to need some trauma advisors or counselors and more hands on deck to deal with these emotions and the feelings they're having as a result of this pandemic and changes that they've encountered in education. We need to be equipped and really ready. So that's why when I say I don't agree with us going back, we are by no means ready. And not only the kids are experiencing this, but us as adults and the parents as well are going through these changes. And we need to have that outlet and these resources readily available because I feel like almost um, what's the purpose then besides just having them in the classroom, but they're going to be re returning to a classroom where they're not going to get all of those wonderful things you were talking about, Karen, by the way, I wrote all of those down. What do schools provide? Those are not going to be there for them and they're going to need it. So one of the things that's happening is that schools that are reopening and they're doing it differently, not everyone's doing pods, but they're so focused on the health physical health of students, um, are the desks six feet apart? Um, uh, is the plastic uh, shield up? Do we have enough gloves? Um, how do we keep masks on? How do we have them walk down the hall? So the focus has been largely on the prevention of the transmission of COVID, and I get that. I'm not suggesting that's not important, but it's not enough. It's not even close to enough. And so how you prepare and give tools to teachers so they can help their students be ready for a new school experience, because it is not the same, is a really big challenge. And our focus, unfortunately, has not been on the mental health aspects of this. It's been on protecting people from becoming ill. Now, don't diminish that. I mean, we, we don't want people getting ill, but if we don't do the other, then we have a big problem. And I just wanna share, so many years ago when I was a college president, um, we, we were making lots of changes, which were really hard. I mean. We were changing the culture of the institution. We were changing our size. We were growing and people were feeling the stresses of it. And finally, I, I'm thinking that what we're doing is good, but it's not easy, right? Those old slippers feel awfully comfortable when you take them away and you need other ones. So I gave everybody this, um, and I don't know that you can see it, but it's a paperweight that says, think 
Rome, as in it wasn't built in a day. And I think we would do well to have that feeling now. This is not an instantaneous thing. You have to think Rome, you have to really plan and think through how to reopen. And many schools have shut down without consulting school counselors and school nurses and teachers, and they're reopening without consulting many of those same groups again, and just dictating what the outcome will be. And so if you want schools to be places of healing, you have to engage in thoughtful preparation, planning and predicting with non-siloed conversations. What, where is that? Now, I, I still have hope. I, I, I still have hope, but I'm just asking. Ed, do you wanna chime in? Well, you're asking a very <laughs> challenging question. Um, I, I will share with you, uh, you know, kind of from my perspective, uh, and and uh, because I did actually talk to one of the school, uh, and and they, you know, they are also working very uh, with particularly very, uh, let's say, challenging students that are learning disabilities. I mean, we haven't even talked to, talk about you know that group of uh, uh, young people or children. Uh, it is so hard for them, you know, to engage online. They really need, you know, kind of a more face-to-face -face and a and, uh, lot of support. And, and I think we haven't even, you know, really talked about that group. But I think the one that I suggested, and, and again, this is in some senses at a very theoretical level, uh, but I just by he hearing what you all said, I think that there's things already going on with school, you know, try to think this through. Um, and this ties back into Karen, your triphasic model. And, uh, you know, the, I'm familiar from my perspective about mental health, mental illness related to the triphasic model. You know, it, it kind of gone way back to uh, uh, really one of a person that I respect a lot, a psychiatrist named uh, Judith Herman and her colleagues talk about the triphasic model. Again, really from a mental health kind of a perspective, this is specific in response to trauma victims. Um, so I kind of apply that concept in terms of what we're talking about today, about uh, onto your uh, PowerPoint slide. Uh, one of the first thing we, we need to do, and then this is what I talk to the school, it's just from my perspective, and, and I know that they have to really alter that and customize it the way that they think they can do. First, it's all about safety and control. That's face, basically, if you look at the triphasic model in treatment therapy, it's about you know, safety and control. Kids, um, I mean, students and educators and those are in school, everyone needs to feel safe. And I think often that issues came up, am I safe to go back to school? That's for teachers as well as for students, as well as parents of students. So how do we assure that sense of safety? And then also then develop a sense of control that with all the things happening, I think there's need to be a feeling of control. I'm in control of the situation personally, but there's also the external control, which I think a school can do a lot with that. So that's the phase one. I'm mean, using your model now. Karen, you, you were going to interject. So well, I, I think one of the, the points you're making um, is that for me, safety is not just physical safety. It's also psychological safety, oh, yeah. a safe psychological space. And why couldn't schools in advance set up care rooms that are um, care rooms for the educators and care rooms for the students that have trauma responsive things in them, like weighted blankets and um, candles and other kinds of things. I, I get that we have to be careful in the pandemic about transmission. Okay, so you have to, you can't have play tables in the same way you used to without giving them gloves. But if we thought about it long enough, we could come up with it. And why not before the school even reopens, we designate space as care space. Teachers are missing that safety, the safety of engaging with each other and just sharing there. 
Yeah, and, and, and I have to really leave that for the school, uh, you know, you know, administration and the school themselves to think about how is that, uh, you know, uh, you are right, you know, and, and as a matter of fact, I have seen schools that have created, you know, even pre-pandemic in terms of how to create a safe space, let's say for some students that are very difficult to manage, you know, when, when they have big feelings and meltdown and how they're being removed uh, from classroom and not in a, in a punitive way, but in more of a supportive way. And I have seen that some of that development, particularly in, in trauma responsive school. Uh, I mean, uh, during the, I believe the Obama administration, I mean, there was a big, big push in terms of trauma responsive school or trauma informed school. So, so yes, I, I will absolutely you're right, you know, about safety and then, you know, that sense of control, I think is important. Then the next thing that I actually encourage us to think about is that sense of uh, almost like mourning or telling the individual stories. And I think that is very powerful. And that ties into, I think I mentioned earlier in terms of when, uh, when Brian described my work, I really truly believe in personal stories as well as community stories. Uh, that's also ties into particular oral history related to race issues. And you know, again, you know, this is, if we really drill, need to drill down, you know, it's very different when you're working in a you know urban do, uh, school district that has a lot of let's say racially diverse individual versus let's say maybe a suburbia school that is, tends to be more homogeneous. So, but it's it's that opportunity you know to mourn, also maybe to be angry of what's happened, uh, and to create that story. So that's the second piece I would say. You know, school. You know, this is what I know. You know, and, and see what you can do with that. And then the final piece that I think you all said is that reconnect. There's a need of reconnect of who each individual as, as well as the school community. What does that mean? Uh, because I think in some sense, really in some sense, we are creating a new identity, you know, after the pandemic. But on top of that, I, I really think that we are in some sense moving to a different identity I think because our country is going through a very historical time and that's reflected back to Karen, what you said. I think pandemic is certainly one, but there's also about, you know, the, uh, the root cause of some of the violence. Uh, we're also looking at racism issues. I, I think this is the, to me, it is a historical change moment. So is that fair that the school has to do all that? Uh, you know, I know that it's a lot of work, but, you know, a child goes to school how many hours a day, you know? It, it, so, so answering your question, can school be a place to, you know, uh, for healing trauma or just for healing? You know, some people don't like the word trauma and I always said, it's okay. You know, you define what, what it is. It's whatever the demand on you, we can call it stress, we can call it trauma, but it's the demand. I can only offer you the science, both in terms of the physical aspect of response to stress, as you stay, also stated, Karen, is also the psychological response, you know? And um, so it's both physical and psychological. So this is from my perspective, how, you know, a school, I, I part of it, I think they just need to build on some of the things. I'm blessed, I guess I'm blessed with school that I, I'm part of that they, they are paying attention but do they have enough resources to do that? No. Do they, you know, I have not, haven't seen one school and say, oh, we know it all, we don't need training. They all want the training, but that is also, you know, require resources. It requires the commitment in terms of what's professional development, PD, you know, this, so, so it's, it's, it's a lot of challenge. You know, and I think um, what's missing is that the administrators are not really asking the people that they need to. They're not involved in the teachers in the decision. They need to have the teachers tell them, here's what will help us feel safe. Here's what we can do to welcome the students back. It's like you just say, we're gonna open schools up and we've got everything set up, but they're not dealing with what's gonna happen once those students get there. What happens if someone gets sick? You know, Do you have a place for them to go? There's so many steps. And if they have more teachers involved in those decisions, I think it would help make the school opening 
a little better. I think the teachers will feel better about going back because they've had a say so. And I think that the uh, mental health, the counselors, the psychologists and social workers, they all need to come together and let the principals know, hey, wait, stop. We can't have the teachers come back until we do some thinking and working together as to what we're going to do and how we're going to face different situations. You know, even from the cafeteria workers, you know, they're going to have to serve food. You know, what would be how are you going to help them to understand the students and the secretaries in the school, uh, the custodians, you know, you know, they're going to say, well, clean this, clean that. There's only so much they can do. And so we're going to have to work together as a team, I think, going back, because it's not going to be the same. Like we said, it's going to be a new normal. And we're going to have to deal with how do we face everything on top of what's going on outside, because none of us are feeling very safe about going anywhere. And so when this new virus is mutating, and then you're saying open the schools, and no one's saying, well, how am I going to be safe? It's just so many questions, you know, and the school can be a place of healing if it's done correctly, if you bring all the parties together and have a dialogue and decide how you're going to do it together, because the teachers are the ones who are going to be in there, and they need to have a say-so. So I think one of the problems, oh, I was, I'm sorry, Karen. I was just going to say, Pat, you are absolutely right. Um, the last, I want to say two weeks ago, they actually had a meeting and they asked us for our input as in regards to how Good. they should develop a plan. And mm -hmm. I think I was the first one to say, well, thank you for including us. <laughs> not, not to say it in, in a way that makes them feel bad, but just like we've been waiting on this opportunity and a lot came out as a result of it. You know, a lot of things they had not considered because our school is like rated really terribly <laughs> with ventilation. Um, we don't, we don't have, we can't sustain the students and everybody to make the regulations. It just wouldn't work. But that was something they hadn't considered. So I think it was a, a it was something that we have been waiting on. But I think a lot of times, um, how do we push that on our administrators and say, like, what about us? Because we always say, what about us? But, you know, it was finally that time where they said, well, we need to talk about it with the teacher. So I think we need more instances of that where they actually come to us and say, well, what are you guys feeling? Because I don't think, um, and I think I told my administrator and I told Karen about it, that they didn't know that I was delivering supplies to my students. Um, they did not have books. They did not have pencil, paper, dry erase mark. I was actually getting up and during my breaks for lunch break and delivering it to them because I live in the neighborhood of all of my, my students and taking it to them. And a lot of people will say, well, why would you do that? But I knew that if I didn't, those students would not be engaged in the learning. So mm -hmm. after I told my principal that, she was like, oh, well, I didn't want to enable the parents, but I was like, it's not enabling, it's about meeting the needs right now. And I think we all need to focus on just meeting the needs. If we all come together, we might actually <laughs> be able to get somewhere, but it takes that teamwork and that discussion and listening to each other where we might actually move some, a couple of steps forward, you know, in this process. It's gonna be long. And like you said, Rome, it's not gonna be built in one night, but I think that dialogue Dialogue has to begin somewhere and it has to start with the teachers and everybody working together and just listening and meeting those needs. So um, I think one of the shared themes is that the locus of control feels like an externality, not an internality. And our mm -hmm. world makes us feel out of control between the problems with the vaccine distribution, the threats of violence, the issues of the pandemic. I, I mean, the, there are so many uncertainties before us. It, to the extent you can move the locus of control from an externality to an internality by asking people to engage with you, that helps just that as you described. And so while there are some trauma responsive schools out there, I have to say that there are many, many schools that are not. And, you know, now that I'm listening to you, I'm thinking, wait a minute, I've spent a lot of time helping students directly and helping teachers. Maybe I should be spending some time with administrators. <laughs> no, I mean, maybe I've like missed. I, I'm actually, it's kind of sad, but I think I might have like missed a key cohort. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. 
What? Because if they don't understand, they can't help their teachers. And the teachers don't understand, they can't help their students. So, you know, it starts at the top and comes down. Hmm. Yeah, and also bottoms up too, in terms of how yeah. you know, speaking to each other. And and I guess right. you know, again, uh, I just you know picked out what Karen you said about the triphasic model. You know, the first step is the sense of safety and control. And control, you're right in terms of locus of control, both internal and external, uh, because they have to work together. You know, you cannot be one without the other. And uh, so, if there's a mechanism. Uh, like Sakina said in her school, I, I think that's a that's a great start. Uh, you know that also kind of falls back into something called the Abraham Maslow. You know the uh, the needs hierarchy. <laughs> the first one on the bottom is safety. Yes, <laughs> and, but you know I actually think if you ask people, administrators, teachers, parents, kids, how to solve certain of these problems, they'll come up with amazing ideas if you give them the opportunity to do that bold, creative ideas that you haven't even thought of. Like, it's interesting. I've, I've done programs on how to engage the disengaged student. And one of the things I've said is, why don't we ask them? What would help you become more engaged? Like, hello? Like, <laughs> like why aren't we? Oh, we're like making assumptions uh, and we can identify them as disengaged because just because you're present doesn't mean you're engaged. And just because you're not online doesn't mean you're disengaged. Okay, we can get that far. But why don't we say, so what would help you? You know, one of James Ryan's questions is, what can I do to help you? And I used to go around the campus and say, what can I do to make your life better? That made people, I mean, people would say to me, are you serious? Are you really asking? I say, yeah, I'm really asking. So some people would say, oh, their shower curtain needs to be fixed in the dorm. But other people would say, well, you know, I'm struggling with this or I'm, I can't do this. Mm -hmm. And then we'd actually talk about it. I learned more by asking that question about the campus than I did by any other means other than the sort of informal grapevine. So my point is we need to ask questions. We need to talk to each other across silos to make this happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think that that's critical. I, I also think stories are really important. And I, I thought maybe before we open it up for the audience and participants to ask and talk that we could each share a story um, that you know might be uh, apropos of Ed's observation that personal stories make a difference here. So. Right. Well, let me share one. You know, one teacher shared at a meeting we had that um, she was teaching her class and she kept hearing this noise go off. And, it was, and she kept saying, what is that noise? And one of the kids said, oh, that's just a fire alarm. And so she realized that in a lot of the homes, you know, every October you're supposed to put a new battery in and um, the fire alarms went off and the parents and the students just didn't pay any attention to it because they're so used to hearing that sound that it didn't bother them. But she called the school and told them, look, we need to do something. So they got in a partnership with the fire department to go around and deliver batteries to those homes so that they could, you know, stop the fire alarms from going off. Because they couldn't teach because it was just this buzzing all of a sudden in all the different homes and apartments. And it used to happen in a lot of apartments and homes in certain neighborhoods that are underserved. And they just don't get the batteries and they're just used to the noise. And so it's just observing those things and trying to meet the needs in a different way, you know. Sakina, share about the, the story of how you celebrate the 100 days and what you're going to do. OK, so typically in school, it's a big thing in kindergarten to celebrate the 100 day of school. Actually, when you do it, the kids actually think that's the last day of school. It's funny, but it's like, no, we're so, this is a big milestone, like 100. So it's, it's exciting. But um, this year, I had to think differently about like, how am I going to go about it? Because it's actually a pretty big milestone for all of us to have been virtual for 100 days. So I decided that I'm going to take some of the activities that I would normally do and see if I can actually do it with the students virtually. For example, um, 
we do a race to 100 where it's like they I know that they have dice we call them number cubes at home and they roll it and then if it says six they color six numbers you know and they're counting as they do it and I'm I'm thinking about what is it that they already have readily available to them and what is it that I can supplement and bring to them so that they can do it as well so I made copies already I have a big stack and I'm just gonna put them in Ziploc bags and this weekend I'm gonna go and deliver it to all the students so they have that so a lot of teachers and it's not just me there's some teachers who are doing some wonderful things out here in this virtual world um, but we're just going to kind of do it that way I have different activities and in addition to that I had to rethink Valentine's Day how are we going to do Valentine's normally we would exchange and it would be a great thing to do I'm trying to figure out you know what is it something we can engage in where we're all still sharing um, about it we often do um, in my classroom I do a kindness day where each um, scholar shares something about another person. So I'm thinking that type of exchange needs to happen on Valentine's Day where they can actually create it at home and then just write something about another person on the back and share it with each other. Again, that connection piece I'm noticing is very important and, um, and it's key to me teaching. So that's kind of what I've been doing. And I don't have any special stories to share with you, but I can just share one that touched me the other day was share from my colleague. Um, when her student uh, told her, pulled up a picture of the school and she told her that I Google the school every day so I can see what our school looks like and I can still feel like I'm part of the school. I think that was so powerful. You know, here it is a five or six year old who's still Googling our school and looking at the picture and just maybe holding on to that hope, Karen, again of, you know, I'll be here one day and I just want to remember what it is that my school looks like. Um, profound right there. Our kids are what keep us going and we have lots of moments of that. That's why I don't have one in particular. I think I have many um, experiences like that with my kindergartners. And I'm, I, although this is trying, I think that they really are holding on to, we all are holding on to that hope. And in the meantime, I think we also talked about not all of this is negative. There are some positive things that have come out as a result of virtual learning. I, for one, I have a six, I have a six-year-old child at home, and I tell you, she has a schedule. <laughs> Literally, if I gave her a Google Calendar, she probably could put it in there. She has her own schedule. She knows that twelve. 50. I have to log back on for class at one o'clock. She's very on time about things. She's a stickler about it. She's very responsible. And that's something I feel like virtually she has learned. And not only my kid, but parents are sharing with me that they don't have to regulate their, their students anymore. They they do it on their own. So it hasn't all been negative, it's been positive. I mean, I like the fact that in the morning, my kids now understand how to ask me, how are you feeling? And I'm like, wow, you're asking about me. And then I return it back to them, but we're having that exchange and dialogue, things that we probably wouldn't have had a chance to talk about in the classroom. It might've been a good morning and they go about their regular routine, but now we're actually engaging in like, I'm doing great or I'm feeling fantastic. And they'll say, well, why are you feeling that way? I'm loving those those moments that we're having um, in my classroom. And thank you, Nicole. I do know about Jack Hartman. I've met him and I'm his number one fan probably. And I'm just trying to come up with a whole bunch of different ways to engage the students and keep it fresh because the novelty has the novelty of learning virtually wore off probably in October. So we are pulling out all the tricks in the bag to keep it I do, I do spirit day every day with my kids. I know Pat probably has seen me come into meetings with my hair all crazy. <laughs> <laughs> my clothes backwards and inside out, but whatever I have to do to keep them engaged, I am going for it because I know that's what I have to do. And I know that is working because I see my students growing and, and, and it might not be the growth that the district is looking for, but it's those small moments that I'm looking for that matter most to me. So I, I see in the chat room, there's an administrator who says I re respectfully disagree. Um, but I, I want to just share a story of what I did when I was an administrator, because I think when the pandemic is over, this is something people should consider. It gets to the issue of engaging people in different ways and setting up role models and administrators serving in a different role. So as an administrator, I went to lots of meetings. I went and gave speeches in lots of places from Rotary clubs to churches to professional meetings to you know fashion shows in New York City and I had a grant to take at least two students with me all the time 
and they went with me to these events. And they'd stay in hotels. Um, they would come to the events. Um, I mean, and there were amazing experiences for them and for me. I mean, first of all, if you sit in a car that long, um, you actually have to talk to the person. I mean, eventually you have to like say something. Um, and they also would have experiences of places they had never been before. I remember a student saying, oh, there's a taxi. I've never seen a taxi. She was from Vermont. I've never seen a yellow taxi. Um, but those experiences of the students being with you, I, I remember we, we, I took, um, I was going to Canada. And that was when you could get there easily. Well, you could get there. Um, and my assistant said to the students, two students, because it was a judicial conference, um, you know, you have to bring a suit. And one of the students says, well, I, I have a, a jogging suit. And she goes, no, 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 I don't think she meant a jogging suit. I think she meant a real suit. Let me take you to a store. And, and so part of the grant paid for all of these things that helped these students grow and learn and engage in a different way. And for me as an administrator, I learned more about our students and their lives and help them grow and become their best selves by not sticking to the way we used to do things, but by doing it really differently. Mm -hmm. By the way, years later, um, I still am in touch with many of those students. So I guess it, I get that many administrators are working very hard. I, to be fair, I do work with school principals um, and superintendents, um, but I have to say that not all of them are on the same page with the students and the teachers and the staff that are quote under them. I just, I, I have to be honest about what I see. And sadly we would do better if instead of a hierarchy that was like a pyramid, we thought about leadership at a school like a wheel where the head of the school is in the center of the wheel and then there are spokes that go out and then at the outside are the students and at the end of the day that's where we're at right the students are what matter they make the wheel go around the teachers are the vehicles along with the coaches and the staff of getting it to go and the person who's the leader is basically a really good conductor like an orchestra conductor they're not on top they're in the middle Uh, so I'm looking at, I'm going through and scrolling through uh, the comments that have uh, popped up. Uh, and there's uh, a variety of uh, wonderful comments. One, one comment uh, that was made a little bit earlier on, it was about the ways in which one of the, um, uh, one of the attendees uh, remarked about how, how much she learned uh, from her children's parent, uh, from her children's teachers, uh, and you know that's another that's another shout out to people like you, Sakina. But the importance, so you know, I, I wonder if that speaks to if you want to take it a step back a little bit about the importance of community. Another way of kind of framing this, the importance of community and thinking of the school as a community. Well, I know Pat has a lot to say on schools as communities, um, and so does Ed. So I'll let it that. It is part of it. Yeah, I think um, you know the school is a community because we meet so many needs, and I think um, the healing comes with if the kids can go back, um, they get fed breakfast and lunch. Um, there's a nurse there; they can go and see if they're not feeling well. And a lot of students use that as an escape to get out of the classroom when they're feeling anxious. They just, oh, I have a headache. I got to go see the nurse. They get their medication there. Um, they feel safe. Um, they have friends there. And so just seeing a friendly face that you know, you know, being in isolation is really hurt a lot of the kids and the parents really can't take them anywhere. And so the school brings it all together. You know, it's like a big family. You know, you have 
many families all over the place. And then the teachers, um, you know, working together is another big family. And everyone in the school, you know, plays an essential role. And so it is a community. It's like a little village under, you know, a house. And everyone comes together and everyone has a different role. And I think that um, as we look at going back, we have to look at what does the community need, you know, and to be prepared because the children are going to come and we have to be ready for them as a community school. Can we meet all their needs? Do we have someone there for someone who's coming and screaming? I don't want to go. I don't know what's happening. You know, I'm going to catch something. You know, they're going to have to wear a mask. Everyone's going to look different. Um, they're going to be isolated. And suppose they're not with their friends. You put them in this room and then their friends are in another room. And there's going to be a lot of things going on. So I guess we have to look at what does the community need and how are we as part of that community able to meet those needs? Sure. And what would you say about that? The community, as far as the mental health services that are going to be at the front door for healing, they're going to come straight to you. <laughs> well, you know, uh, you are absolutely right, Pat. Um, first of all, you know, school cannot do everything. You know, school is part of a community. And the, the, the parallel experience is that, you know, when we develop different types of model in terms of how to, uh, both in terms of mental health uh, care uh, and also promoting, let's say, family wellness, mm -hmm. uh, positive parenting and so forth, um, it's all about, you know, everyone in the community, uh, you know, the gatekeeper, so to speak, to get involved. And I, I have done, you know, in different cities and states uh, and also, you know, uh, outside of this country as well. That's why I talk about, you know, that, uh, that history, you know, the oral history of a community is very, very criti critical to, you know, for the purpose of planning and really in some sense get people buy-in uh, to understand what really, as you describe, what's needed, um, and the fact is that I, I think I think that we shouldn't assume what's being needed because you know our community is so diverse, both in terms of race, ethnicity. Um, certainly, uh, places that I work with, there's also diversity in in educations and and health literacy, mental health literacy. So, so it's really a, a time and I, I, I don't, you know, I don't want to put this as a burden of the school, but it's really a burden of a community coming together and really to have, you know, kind of a dialogue and conversations and identify what's the next step. Uh, you know, their services outside of the school setting can really wrap around uh, for, you know, children and adolescents is going to school. Uh, so, you know, that also in some sense needs to be in place. Uh, yes, the, I think the school is really, um, well, at least the school that I'm familiar with, you know, they're trying to do so much, you know. Uh, I remember a few years ago that everyone is talking about, you know, the need of mental health in school. So as a matter of fact, in Massachusetts, we, we developed something called, you know, school-based mental health, that we have clinicians in school you know, uh, to provide those services. And I know that other states have done uh, similar work as well. Uh, but I think what we need maybe is the first step uh, and recognizing that we are all together. This is not about administrator versus teachers versus support staff. We are all into this together because of the result of the pandemic and really other root causes uh, of this, you know, country that has really raised its ugly head, you know, because of what happened. And I think it is it's really time to for us to really, in some sense, to say what can we build on. You know, I don't think we need to start from scratch. I'm I'm very optimistic in that regard. I think there are a lot of good things have been done, but it just has not been really organized and integrated. Maybe at the policy level, certainly, because that has to come down and support you know teachers ultimately. And and the outcome of that is you know how our children can really. Uh, learn uh, to their, you know, full potential. I mean, that's a bigger issue. I always call it, that's the wicked problem. You know, that's the complex problem. But I think we, we need to go with the low hanging fruits. Uh, that, that's I always, you know, it, it's a pattern type of advice. You know, wh where can we go with the low hanging fruits right now? What can we build on? What can we build on the, let's say the success stories of Sakina, uh, you know, Karen and you Pat, provided. 
let's build on that. You know, we're not starting from scratch, but so we have to focus. We have to be better. Something it just dawned on me, and I, I, I know it's really hard for the participants because we've been going for a long time. So I, I can see some of them are are fading away. So I want to make sure their voices are heard. Um, and so participate in the chat. And then I don't know if Brian wants to open it up to, to letting um, people speak, but I put in the chat some questions or observations that you have. Um, I'm thinking when, when I helped reopen a school after 9-11, which was really a, a horrific task um, because the school was right at ground zero. And so the school had to shut. And then when we reopened, we were very close, literally there to all the ambulances and construction and emergency vehicles. And there was a terrible smell in the area. I mean, but one thing that we did when we reopened is that we brought in a team of um, psychologists and psychiatrists who basically stayed there for a month. And anybody could go and see them. I mean, you could make an appointment or you could just drop in. They did group stuff, they did individual stuff. And what we said is, this is here for you. So when we reopened, students would come to my office and they'd like share everything that happened to them in the three weeks that we were closed, including watching this and watching that and losing this and losing that. And then I'd say, you know, I'm really glad you shared and I think the people who can really help you are, uh, is this team that we've brought in and they're here and you know, here's how you get in touch with them. So I'd listen for an hour and it's interesting because the female faculty, not to make a gendered comment here, but the female faculty had lines of students outside their office waiting to come in and talk to them. And I remember one male faculty who said at a meeting, well, everything's back to normal. I said, maybe in your world, not in my world, um, but that team that came in, that trained and prepared and or self-organized went to a number of schools. I mean, they stayed at our school, our team did. And then another team went to a different schools. Why aren't we thinking about that? You know, when, when over 400,000 people died and millions are ill, you would think we would, have these teams when we reopen of psychologists and psychiatrists who could go in. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's of the magnitude, isn't it? Of something like 9-11? It is, just like it. I think it's the resources. I think we don't really have a lot of psychologists like Ed said and social workers who are willing to go back into the situation. and. We've always been shorthanded when it came to psychologists and social workers and counselors. And so more falls on the teacher, which we're really going to have to give the teachers skills to deal with some of these situations because they're not going to always have the help. Could I share the trauma box, Karen, the idea that you um, gave? From Karen's book, when she did one of the workshops, she talked about the trauma box. And so I made one. And I think for teachers, just to have for yourself, or you can make one for the students. This one is more for an adult teacher. So if you're feeling stressed after a day, you need to just get a box. This is a little cigar box. And I just put these things in there. It's like a little um, quotation, keep calm and be good to yourself. It's a little magnifying glass. It's a little name tag with my name on it. You might make something like that. And of course you always have the stones. Um, this is today is gonna be a good day. And I think having a rock, you know, you could have students get rocks or you could get a rock and paint it with fingernail polish and put your own work on it. I always like Charlie Brown because, you know, he always has a problem and everyone has problems now. So we can relate to that. A little stone you can carry around your pockets as friends. Different little color rubber band, uh, paper clips that you can just link together and talk about the different colors of how you're feeling. To have something soft that you can squish you know, for that stress when you're feeling it, come on, just pick up your little stress material. Um, and a little notebook or something to write, a little gratitude leaf where, um, you know, if you just 
think about the things that you're grateful for. Say thank you whenever possible and just thank people. You know, we may have to go back to that, uh, the kindest days when you see people um, treat them the way you would like to be treated. And then for students, you can just have a shoebox and you just put things in that would engage them. And sometimes you might be able to start off your class with something. Now, this is just a fan and took the bottom off and says, what love is? You can have a discussion on that. You know, at the doll store, they have these little books. I think journal writing is a good time to get kids to express themselves, even adults. Uh, my book of stories. Just think of all the stories they could write since school's been closed. Mm -hmm. And then we have one, a journal, and it has the little lines on it. And so they could write their own stories just as a calming thing. Um, to have something to, you know, you're an amazing teacher, or this teacher needs a cup of coffee, or she was born to teach, something positive to lift your spirit. A little smiley face you know another little squeeze is a brain something cuddly you know kids like to have something cuddly to play with inspiration is all around you you have some cubes something karen said you should have things to put together so you can get these little things and you just have the kids sit there and put the colors together and make different shapes and things have something they can shake you can take the little gel out and it's like this putty then you have the little circles so you can have on different chairs or you could put right go to the red stuff a little just high something simple a little pen with a little face on it you know it's amazing how people just um little ink pens with faces on it something to look at and then this is a little slap like bracelet it's called lift each other up and you just slap it on your arm like that, and you could go around and do that. This one is, we can change the world together. And so, you know, it's another little slap bracelet. Little different bands with different colors. It's a, you know, you can use them in all different ways. Maybe a magnifying glass. What do you see today? You know, do you see anything different? Get up close and have them look. See if they can go around their house and find something. Um, you know, just all of those little things and I just love saying, enjoy the little things. And I think that's something we have to help them to understand that, you know, we have to enjoy the little things in life. And then maybe a book, you know, poetry is important. I think it expresses yourself. Get kids to write poetry or read poetry to them. You know that famous book um, we used to have and read, but just reading different things to students every day. And so we call that, it could be your care box, your trauma box, your happy box. You know, whatever you want to put in, you can make it. But I think if we do something and you can even get the kids to make one for themselves, you can make one for yourself. Just something to take your mind off what's happening. Put the things that you really like in a box and you could go to that box every day or you could start the day off and say, oh, let's talk about the happy face. How does this make you feel? How's it feel? And you bring in the meditation. We talk about the color. How's it feel? What would it taste like to have a happy face, you know? I think those are some things I picked up from your book, Karen, and you shared with us before. I just really think it's important that the teachers think about their own mental health and things they can do for themselves. And to make a little box that they can go to, I think makes the world. You know, even words. I know one person, she puts different words in the box. I'm going to take your word understanding or patience, and I'm going to put in this box. And she puts a top on it. And the next time you meet, who has another word to put in the box? So I think those things just help us to feel at peace because there's so many teachable moments coming out of this experience. I think we have to use them and not let them go by. You know, there's something happening every day or every month that we can teach and focus on and say, let's look at what's happening today in the world. How do you feel about that? You know, because they don't have a chance to express this and all these feelings are bubbling up inside. And when they come out, it's not going to come out gently. And so we have to sort of give them and give ourselves ways to let these feelings out. So one of the, thank you for that wonderful um, set of toolboxes. Um, I, I recently did a program with school counselors on how to create toolboxes for their students. And I'm reading in the chat room and almost every school counselor wrote, I need one. <laughs> create them for the students, but frankly, I really need one of those um, trauma toolboxes. And some educators are using them when 
things aren't when people aren't paying attention or they're not all tuned in they just say go use your your toolbox or your break box or your care box um and if they're small enough students can carry them with them they can have them on their night table they could even bring them to school they can share what's in them they can be built by teachers with students they can be built for students they can be built in any number of ways but they're very powerful to have one's own box and just having the box, even if you don't use what's in it, knowing it's there is really valuable because you know there's a place you can go and a space you can go um, that's, that's your space to find. And if you think about building the boxes using your five senses, that's really helpful too. Um, because you want to activate the senses because the trauma truncates the senses and you can open neural pathways by activating the senses. So those trauma toolboxes are a, a, a valuable tool. I, I just want to mention this book. I know we're getting close to the time called The Boy, the Mole, the Fox and the Horse by Charlie Maxey. Um, and as as valuable as my own book is, and I, I, I hope many of you will read it and think about um, mm -hmm. the issues in it. Um, this book is is even more illustrated than my book, um, and it involves a set of questions and answers between the boy, the fox, the mole, and the horse, which many people view as different parts or parts of a single individual. But some of the questions that are asked and some of the ones that are really consistent with what we've been talking about here. So one of them, the boy observes, how come we pay so much attention to what we look like on the outside when most of what happens that's important is on the inside? Mm -hmm. Or the boy is asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? And he answers, come. And later there's an observation by the boy, home isn't necessarily a place, is it? And at another point, the boy says to the horse, you believe in me more than I believe in myself. And the horse says, don't worry, you'll catch up. So I, I raise that because it's, it's a very powerful, very simple, but deep, um, set of messages in the book that can be read with kids, to kids, by kids even. Um, it's remarkably um, powerful in its um, sort of counterintuitive, but really deep sentiments and helps, I think, address the issues of trauma. So, Brian, it's yours to wrap up. Okay, well, um, I think that we've covered a tremendous amount in a very small time, a uh, small uh, amount of time, and we've only scratched the surface. So we're just going to have to do this every week, aren't we? <laughs> just kidding. Um, I want to thank the panelists uh, for uh, participating in the webinar. I want to thank the attendees uh, for their probing questions and useful uh, comments. And um, we're very grateful that you came. Um, if you uh, are so inclined, and we certainly hope you are, if you haven't already gotten a copy of, of Karen's book, Trauma Doesn't Stop at the School Door, please do so. Uh, we have the uh, discount and code uh, in the chat. Uh, and we want to, again, thank you. And panelists, uh, thank you uh, for uh, what, uh, what you shared today. So I want to thank all of you also, and Brian, you're really the reason this book got done. Um, so you deserve a very special thank you for that. And to my friends and colleagues, Pat, Sakina, and Ed, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, I really value both our friendship and working together. So may we keep doing it. And everybody out there, be well, stay safe, take care. Indeed. Good night, guys. Good night, everyone.